Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Sir Lawrence Friedman, who is Professor Emeritus of War Studies at King's College uh, in London. He is a prolific writer of articles and books on issues of security, including uh, nuclear deterrence, uh, matters of war and peace. Uh, he has many publications. Uh, some of his uh, books include Nuclear Deterrence, Strategy, A History, and his most recent book is The Future of War, A History. Sir Lawrence, welcome to Berkeley. Good to be here. Where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born uh, in the northeast of England, uh, a place called uh, Whitley Bay, uh, which is close to Newcastle. Uh, and I stayed there until I went to university at 18, never really been back. And, and uh, looking back, how did your parents shape your thinking about the world? Um, I mean, my father was, um, had a shop, uh, was not particularly successful uh, at business, uh, but he'd been uh, a commissioned officer during the war. Uh, he was in the fleet air arm. Uh, uh, he joined in '38. Uh, he ended up a lieutenant commander. Uh, so that was very important to me. It was important to him. Uh, so the sort of the shadow of the Second World War w was very important. Um, being Jewish was important uh, because where I was, there weren't very many Jews. So it was. Uh, uh, I had a sort of sense of of difference, but as I sort of went into my teens, became interested in the Holocaust and started to find out more about it. That was important. But basically, it, it was a, you know, a not unusual sort of lower middle class upbringing. Uh, my parents were, were, were close. Uh, I, I was influenced a lot by my brother because neither of my parents had been to university. He was the first to go to university. But it, 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 there was nothing particularly exceptional about it. What, what was, the, was there a discussion uh, at the dinner table about war and issues of current events and so on? Certainly a lot about current events, um, particularly Sunday lunch. My dad was working all hours the rest of the time, but Sunday lunch was important for that, when, when the family conversations took place. And yeah, we, we, we were, we were uh, it was a politically aware family. Um, again, my brother being a bit older than me uh, was very influenced in he, by politics and uh, uh, by the time I went to university when I w w was 18, I was very political, very determined. This was the 60s. I was very determined to be uh, very radical and uh, change the world. And, and where did you do your undergraduate and graduate work? So <clears throat> I went to Manchester University in the Northwest. Um, of England, uh, did my <coughs> undergraduate there. <coughs> Excuse me. Then I went to York, uh, did a, a, a master's, and actually taught there for a year. And I ended up at Oxford to do my uh, what they call a DPhil PhD, uh, and uh, finish it off there. And and were uh, as as you did your advanced studies, was there one mentor or teacher who was really influencing? you greatly in, in terms of the direction your studies took? Yes. Um, I was in, by the time I got to Oxford, uh, I'd had, a, I think, a pretty wide-ranging uh, education, and I was interested. I'd done sciences at high school, so uh, I'd moved into the social sciences. I was interested in political sociology, political theory, um, and I'd moved into an interest in military things uh, almost by accident, because it, uh, I was interested in the role of experts, and I'd chosen, because I wasn't scared of the science, I'd chosen nuclear scientists. Then I ended up at Oxford, and Michael Howard um, became my supervisor, and uh, that, be, that w was and still is, in fact, he's 95 now, uh, a very close relationship. He, 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 um, he, he was my mentor, every, every move I made in the earlier stages of my career, I would be consulting him. Uh, but basically, 
uh, he, he was a role model. I, uh, the, the first, when I found out he was going to be my supervisor, I didn't know of him. I went to buy a book uh, of essays of his, Studies in War and Peace. I started reading them and I didn't stop until I'd finished. Um, and I, you know, this is what I want to do. I, I, I loved his uh, ability to uh, capture great historical movements in a, in a matter of sentences, uh, to his ability to synthesize his readiness to look at disciplines outside history, um, uh, his, his policy engagement. I just thought this was a very complete sort of figure and, uh, uh, and that shaped me a lot. I like to ask my guests what they see as the skills and temperament involved in, in what uh, they do. Well, it's an interesting, I mean, you also have to be very careful talking about your own skills. I think what I found, given the stuff I'm dealing with, uh, which is in some cases very, some cases very distressing, often very controversial. Uh, people have strong feelings about it. Say, if you're dealing with uh, Arab-Israeli conflict um, or nuclear weapons, th these are things people quite rightly uh, get very strong feelings about. So to navigate one's way through this, my basic approach has always been to stay as close as possible to the evidence. And if the evidence tells me what I want to think is wrong, I have to accept that. Um, and I th so I think the, the, the first principle is uh, get the best evidence you can. And, and so I sort of think of myself as a scavenger for, for information. You've got to keep on looking. Uh, you've got at some point you've got to stop because the, the, otherwise you'll never get anything written. But, but I think that's the first principle. The second is the onus is on me to communicate. Uh, I shouldn't assume that uh, if I want to come up with uh, new words uh, or use fancy language that I'll keep my audience. If I want people to read me, I've really got to work at that. So, and, and again, this is something I got from Michael Howard, uh, who was a brilliant stylist. Uh, so I, I think, I, I don't, I mean, I'm not in favor of uh, over-egging it and so, sort of, I don't, I don't think good writing uh, has to be flowery. I think good writing can be quite terse, short sentences and so on. But, it, but I think, so I think that side of things was very important. Third thing, I think, is, is you've got to be prepared to be wrong. Uh, you've got to be able to take risks, uh, try out arguments, but I've never been of the view that uh, I'm infallible. Uh, I, I, looking back, with, uh, both sort of personal, academic, whatever judgments I've made that I'm, I might make differently later on. So, um, uh, and also it's quite important to note that I spent a lot of my time in administration and management uh, while also trying to write books. And uh, I've all, I always found that uh, if you, you you can lead, I think people have to be able, prepared to lead, but it makes leadership easier if people know that if they argue with you and talk to you, your mind can be changed. So I've always tried to keep an open mind as well. What about uh, temperament? Patience must be very important as, for example, your, your, your beautiful book on strategy. That's really a complex uh, project requiring a lot of patience and looking at a lot of sources. I didn't th think of it that way. Uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not impatient, but I, I, I wouldn't con consider myself the most patient to people. I think the thing is, once I'm into a piece of writing, a piece of research, uh, it, it is you know, almost like going into a completely different mood, uh, uh, becoming a different sort of person. Uh, my wife refers to it uh, as my writing days. Uh, so I sort of get into uh, a place where uh, I'm just in, uh, I find it exhilarating. I, I, I don't, I, I've never written on the basis of ordering all my material uh, and then meticulously working it through it. I, I'm always playing with it, changing it, uh, and 
finding a new reference, exploring it, which of course is much easier to do these days than it was when I started. Uh, so I don't find, I don't think of it as being patient. Uh, and indeed, uh, with most of the books I've written, I'm incredibly reluctant to stop fiddling with them, even when we're into sort of proof stage and the publishers are going crazy with changes I want to make. Uh, I, I just sort of see it as a constant um, discussion with myself to try, to try to find out what's going on, why this is an interesting topic, uh, how the argument can be developed. And, and what is the, the key to creativity? Is it a kind of a flexibility uh, which you identify in, in when you're talking about strategy as a way mm. to be able to respond to surprises and what you're discovering as you research and think about what you're researching? Yes, I mean, I've always been very eclectic. I suppose this is something also about my approach, and again, from Michael Howard. I've always been instinctively interdisciplinary. I've never, uh, I started off, uh, I suppose, identifying as a political scientist. Actually, I would have said a political sociologist when, when uh, after my undergraduate times. And then, uh, I sort of became more of a historian and known as a historian, but I always feel of myself as a bit of a hybrid. Uh, and part of the fun is seeing how other people approach topics. So, for example, when I did a book on deterrence, I read quite a bit of criminology because they deal with deterrence. And the comparing mm. how they address, the criminologists address the issue, uh, gave me some ideas about how people in um, uh, security studies might address the issue. Uh, and doing strategy was even more of that, uh, uh, social psychology and economics and so on. And it's intellectually challenging, and, and that's good. But I think it, it also gives you um, uh, a chance to, to see things through, through different eyes. And this is obviously different from a lot of people in my field because they worry much more about the disciplinary boundaries and advancing the discipline. And I'm actually not really interested in advancing mm -hmm. the discipline. I've never seen that as, uh, as what I'm trying to do. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think what I'm doing is science. Uh, I think it's systematic, I hope, and, and, and rigorous and uh, evidence-based. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't want to make great claims for um, what I'm doing as, uh, as developing a discipline and others will follow and build on what I've done. It, I, I've always seen it as uh, setting myself some perplexing problems and trying to find out uh, the best answers. Uh, your strategy book and your new war book both have a subtitle of a history. Yeah. And history is, is very important for you. What, what does working as a historian provide in, in furthering your insight. This is not true, obviously, or at, le at least I think it's not true of political science no. uh, and security studies in the United States. Yeah, I'm very careful to say a history. It's not the history, um, partly because the history would be beyond an individual. Um, so it's, I would make, a history is to make clear it's my take. Um, and, you know, to, Ref reflect my familiarity with uh, UK and American materials. I can move in into other countries, and uh, uh, but I don't feel as comfortable there. So I, 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 I was careful not to overstate the range of what I'm doing. I think the I, I think history is the core discipline for politics. I mean, maybe political scientists don't um, don't always follow it, but that's their mistake. Uh, the idea that you can um, take uh, something from um, Asia in the 21st century and then something from North America in the 20th century and something from Europe in the 19th century uh, and code them and do a regression analysis and believe you're saying you've got a generalization about international politics. I just don't accept. I, 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 I think it's a specious sort of science. Uh, and has actually not produced very much uh, that, 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 that tells us more than, than we could work out by what is often uh, derisively called intuition. Uh, I, I think we, we can work it, you can 
know a lot about international history and have a sense of possibility uh, that uh, it, it doesn't require you to go through all, uh, all of that sort of business. The value of history is it gives you chronology. It reminds you that when one thing was happening, other things were happening that may well have impinged on it. Uh, it tells you that what happened before, um, how that shaped. And if you're interested in that, as I am particularly in the history of ideas, um, these ideas come from places. And often what's interesting is how concepts and ideas develop in one setting and move into another setting. And, and it's the changes that are, that, that are interesting. Um, so this is not to say you can't do comparisons or case studies and so on. Of course, all of those things are helpful. Uh, but, but history always gives uh, gives the content and s context and sequence. Um, th so, you know, you read a lot of stuff where people uh, have just lost any sense of, of chronology, well, uh, and therefore the comparisons they're making are invalid for that reason. W what does this tell us about theory and practice, basically? That, uh, and, and here I mean that the ideas affect what we do with unintended consequences, really. Yes, I, and, I, and I think that's one reason why the theorists or academics uh, should be humble uh, in, in this. We're not accountable, except to our peers. Um, and uh, though there's enormous pressure these days to have impact and to be engaged, and you know, in my time I've done plenty of that, so I'm not by no means opposed to engagement with practitioners. Uh, it is always important to, remember, to have a good feel for the constraints under which they're operating. And the, the, you know, one of the uh, points I'll, I'll make to um, younger scholars if they're interested in policy engagement is remember that this is a two-way thing. The great advantage of working with practitioners um, is that you learn from them. You, not only you pick up you know, what's on their mind, bits and pieces of important information and so on. But you understand the, the way the system works. Uh, uh, the, the, this, this is infallible people working in imperfect organizations uh, with no time often under an awful lot of pressure. Uh, and the pressures are often quite eccentric. So unless you've got, you know, that seems to me an, an important insight that can then influence the way you work. And most of my work, looking back, is about policy making one way or the other. It's about how decisions are made and how choices are made. But but you don't write it to influence policy, really. You're, you're focused on the wonder of, of understanding the context. I think it's important. <coughs> I never, I wouldn't write a book um, with the aim of producing lots of policy recommendations at the end. I, I mean, apart from anything else, I mean, I've seen this happen numerous times, you know, this sort of endless academic cycle of a problem, uh, call for uh, proposals, the grants are handed out, the researchers are, uh, are recruited, the work is done, and by the time it all comes out, the policy debate has moved on <laughs> anyway. Uh, so I don't think, I don't see myself as driven by a policy agenda, and I think academics should feel perfectly free to write something because it's interesting, that, that, uh, and it's advances scholarship. I think that's what we do. Um, when I've got involved in policy debate, it, I find it's often most useful in providing context. Uh, why, why have we got this problem now? Uh, what's the origins of that problem? And also, you know, conceptually, uh, people keep on talking about deterrence as a concept that was developed during the Cold War particularly, but not solely associated with nuclear weapons, and is then transferable uh, to almost any given security problem. Well, it's an interesting question to ask, and, po uh, and unpacking the concept can give you clues as, as to where it might be relevant to, and where not. Those are the are useful things I think academics can do. What do we do about Korea? What, what, what's the next step with Iran? Um, I think you know, I, I, I have views on these. I can make my case. I may know quite a bit about the about the issues, but I wouldn't want to overstate uh, my views compared with uh, 
somebody who's bang in the middle of the actual policy making. And, and in addition to history, uh, one senses that it's this comparative drawing on other fields and the insights. For example, in the at the end of the book on strategy, you you emphasize a or you propose a, a kind of working notion of thinking of strategy as a as a script, yeah. really. Yeah. I, so uh, and that came from social psychology. Now, I certainly wasn't the first in the field to, to do that. I mean, the number of other people had picked up on uh, on this idea before. So I, I, I don't want to emphasize my originality. I, I was derivative there. Uh, but I tried to make a bit more of it. Um, and so part of it w was you know, this idea of script, which is sort of the, the, the mental template that you have that you recognize a situation and something in your head tells you it's that situation and this is what you might expect next and then you realize actually there's differences from your expectations so it, you develop improvisation uh, as you go along and then what was fun having done that was to look at how people also think of scripts which is from uh, plays and drama um, and that which led to a comparison between uh, the control the dra dramatist has over the plot and the strategist who doesn't have control. So, it, which is, becomes a way of making a point uh, of uh, stressing what which was to me the most important thing about strategy, that it is about adap uh, adaption and flexibility and improvisation and it's not a plan, it doesn't follow a sequence of steps to a, a definite destination. So, I just find it very suggestive to, 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 to draw on these uh, other approaches, um, but then turn it into something uh, of my own. A long time ago, when I, w when I was at York, um, uh, and in those days there were these big debates still going on about whether there are paradigms in, um, in political theory and social theory that, that uh, you're a Marxist or you're an idealist or you're a realist or whatever. And I always felt, thought this was pretty artificial. I remember one of my colleagues at one point sort of uh, saying almost in exasperation, well, tell me at what point does mindless eclecticism become creative synthesis? <laughs> uh, and I also thought that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. I, I get also the sense that you are uh, the, how, I want to say this, the hidden elephant in the room is that, that you are a student of human nature, actually. And because as you write, the, the complexity of uh, humans, uh, willfulness, folly, hubris, stupidity, intelligence, creativity, uh, solidarity, the, the human dimensions of war are really striking as you, you become unconventional at, when you look at what actually happens in war. Yeah, I, I mean, the interesting thing about war as a topic for study, I mean, it, it, it's a very grim topic, um, but it also shows human nature at its extremes. So it brings out the worst and can bring out the best, uh, and uh, often in the same person. So that's what makes it particularly interesting. It always used to be my argument as to why we had a Department of War Studies at King's was um, this is a phenomenon that illuminates so much else about, about humanity. Um, and uh, also I think it's important to maintain the sense that what you're talking about uh, is uh, are, are human beings in stressful situations. Uh, again, going back to political science approaches to war, uh, it can become rather dehumanized. Um, it's you know, how do you round up deaths to uh, you know to a round number? Uh, how, are you sure that you've counted accurately? Accurately, how do you capture the aftermath of war, with the, which is often full of um, famine and uh, and uh, economic distress? Uh, it, the, the, you know, so, so the indirect effects of war can be as severe as, as the direct. So uh, if you're not a, prepared to, to, to address that and cope with that, then it becomes a very dehumanized topic. And you can see why people do it sometimes, because it can, you, know, you can be overwhelmed 
by um, the by the numbers, which is why you know a you know, a particular story from the Holocaust can be touch you far more than talking about the the overall statistics of, of the numbers killed, and it's actually it's one reason why I think warfare now of the sort we've been involved in recently often involves at least on, on for the Americans and the Brits individual personalized deaths that you can look at the the pictures of the individuals and think what's been lost and, and what they did rather than just we lost 10,000 today so uh, I think in in uh, I think if you lose that you don't understand what's going on properly but also you forget why the topic matters uh, ideas are important to you and, and ideas have also been in uh, important in understanding how we uh, explain the structural conditions that might lead to war. And so if we look at today uh, environment, uh, one, one concept that's there is the idea of the rise and fall of great power. Uh, talk a little about that idea and what whether it helps us understand what's going on in the world with America in decline uh, and China rising. Yeah, so uh, I mean, it's, a, it's a really interesting uh, topic because it, it's, it's an issue that uh, never quite goes away. So when I started um, with really getting interested in this stuff, which was sort of 72, that's when I started my, my PhD work. The talk then was of the decline of the United States, Vietnam, and then into Watergate and so on, compared with the rise of the Soviet Union, which was I mean, big military buildup which was going on. And then uh, in the late 80s, um, the, it was the US that was overstretched, and Japan and Germany surging forward uh, economically. Um, and now it's the United States in decline and China moving forward so the, uh, uh, and you know, getting the measure of the of the Chinese is an important part uh, of understanding what's going on to the US now you know one response to that is saying well we've been here before and it didn't quite turn out as expected the United States kept on going and these other countries fell by the wayside the Soviet Union eventually imploded Japan Japan went into years of stagnation uh, so who knows what will happen with China? Well, that, that can be misleading. This time it may be different. Um, and then you get the, 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 the question of historical parallels. Um, so Graham Allison produced this book on the Thucydides trap, where he's got six, was it 16 cases of, uh, of transition from one great power to another. Uh, and he said normally it, this leads to war. I think it's I mean, I don't agree with the analysis. I think the, the, and I'm not sure these cases tell us as much as he thinks they do. Uh, but it's still an interesting issue to raise. Is there something about this transitional period? Cory Sharkey has just produced a, a, a lovely book about uh, the transition from sort of UK hegemony to US hegemony, uh, which is peaceful. Uh, and, and that allows it to look um, and some quite important issues, not just about the structures of international politics and power, but values uh, and similarities between the societies. So I think, that, as with all of these things, there's, there's an, an interesting question there. There are comparisons to be made, but it's only the starting point. What's very dangerous is to uh, start reasoning by analogy. Because this happened then, this time it's also going to happen. It, the advantage of making these comparisons over time is to ask what's different, not why this is bound mm -hmm. to be the same. It's, it's rich in insight, but not necessarily a foundation for prediction. Not a foundation for prediction, certainly. Um, I mean, you know, in some cases, people aren't really even making comparisons. So when people talk about appeasement or Munich or so on, it's just a shorthand for we, for we don't trust foreigners and they'll get one over on us or something. It's, it's not even serious uh, comparative research. Uh, and work has been done on, on um, uh, 
Ju July 14 or, or Munich or, uh, or Vietnam as being shorthands for things you've got to be careful about rather than um, uh, a basis for serious uh, sort of analytical comparisons. Um, but when you do look into them, you, you can start to have a view about causation, about what, what can may really make a difference in situations. Um, you know, to take one example, uh, it was clear for whatever reason, not just the railroads, that the decisions in July, August 1914 were rushed. Um, people felt that they had to move quickly. That had enormous influence um, on ways people thought about crisis management afterwards. How do you buy time? How do you get a chance to look at your, your options? So then you can look at Kennedy uh, in Cuba. Uh, in today's age of social media, would he have been able uh, not to say anything in public for so many days while he worked out what to do? Because we know if he'd had to make an immediate decision, it would have probably been much more military. Uh, the work uh, Tom Schelling, say, did on, on, uh, on, on nuclear strategy was all about his concern, about, well, not all about, a lot of it was about um, whether the, 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 the pressure to preempt and so on. So you've got a theme there that you can follow all the way through about, um, about crisis stability and, uh, and preemption, where you can look at these cases and you can learn from them, it can, it can be suggestive as, uh, as to risks that you might face in the, in the future. So um, although every episode is special and particular and peculiar often, it doesn't mean to say that, that you, you can't be looking back to comparable episodes to alert you to possibilities that you might otherwise have missed. In, in uh, the first section of your book on war, you focus on the German victory over the French in 1870. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it is a case where the uh, interpretation of that by the actors and the people who wrote about it was wooden and not nuanced in the way uh, that you were just describing of how we draw ideas from the patterns that I understand the history. Talk a little about that, because the notion was decisive victory meant, on the one hand, that you could still win a war that way, but on the other hand, people uh, uh, then use that as a uh, as an occasion for fear about the lack of preparation, lest they attack again. Yeah. So, the more I looked at Sedan, uh, the more fascinating it became as a. Uh, sort of what we now call it an inflection point, I suppose. Uh, partly, I mean, not least because it you know, completed the unification of Germany. And this is the Battle of Sedan in 1870. 18, September 1870. Um, so well, so it, it was a classic ideal type battle. Uh, started in the morning, ended in the evening. It was clear who'd won at the end. Um, the French army had been badly defeated. A I mean, normal assumption uh, from you know, going back a long way was that if you won a battle of that, in that way, you'd won the war and the politics followed. Um, and of course, it's not quite what happened because the French people didn't accept the result. The Napoleon was out and Napoleon III was out and uh, a republic called and the, uh, uh, an irregular conflict began. Now these, so the interesting question, one interesting question was what the German general staff took from this. Uh, and because von Moltke, who was the great architect of the victory, uh, and who was undoubtedly I think, one of the great strategists uh, of, of the 19th century, um, they were so in awe of his legacy, but so committed to it, um, that they didn't want to lose faith with the idea of the decisive battle. It just became a much more demanding military challenge than it had been before. And even von Moltke himself became skeptical about the possibilities, um, they, they pushed on. So they weren't prepared to abandon uh, this hope. Secondly, the arguments about uh, what happened after the battle with the French Irregulars um, 
meant that the, uh, they became very sensitive to how you made sure that civilians didn't get involved in the future. Uh, and uh, uh, so they took uh, calculated action in Belgium and elsewhere, particularly in Belgium, uh, at the start of the First World War um, to repress the local population so that they had no, you know, that, that they accepted the result. Third, um, the tactics adopted by the Germans against the French people after uh, September uh, 1870 uh, were the matter of big debate between von Moltke and Bismarck. And this debate was really important. I mean, Bismarck got his way, um, but left a view which is incredibly strong to this day that um, politicians should not be allowed to interfere in operational matters. Uh, the, 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 the politicians could decide who you were fighting, where you were fighting, why you were fighting, what should be done with the victories when they'd been achieved, but everything that went on in the middle uh, was a military responsibility, um, which I think is an untenable position, um, but was nonetheless uh, uh, one that you can see very strictly adhered to uh, by the German general staff. They didn't share in in the summer of 1914 the full implications of their plans. They, uh, they didn't subject themselves to civilian interrogation about what it all might mean. And of course the famous comment after the war by Clemenceau that war is too important to be left to the generals um, reflected that, that strong view that, that, that just letting the military establishment determine everything about how the war was going to be fought could just lead you uh, into disaster. It's not to say that politicians by any means get these things right, but, it, but it's just mm. that the military uh, prerogatives could be, um, could lead to danger. And you see, I, it's not in, in this book, but I, I was just be looking at uh, some of the debates of the late 50s in the US about nuclear strategy and, and read Daniel Ellsberg's latest book, which is a very powerful description of, of uh, uh, of what had happened there. And you find uh, the, the heads of strategic air command, uh, Curtis LeMay and Thomas Power, both using this argument that this has nothing to do with the politicians. Even when you're talking about mm. nuclear strikes that are going to cause hundreds of millions, literally hundreds of millions of deaths, this is an operational matter, not for, not for the politicians. So the strength of that idea is very powerful. Uh, this is an interesting discussion because what, what you're demonstrating is your role as a historian is to, to focus on the context and implications yeah. in a way. Uh, so as a theorist, you're able to go back and see patterns that the actors themselves uh, recognize different patterns that in the long run turn out to have consequences for other actors, which changes the meaning of their insights. Yes, I think, that, I think that's true. I think the, um, if you look at this particular issue of, uh, of operational control, which leads you know, eventually to the American military de describing an operational level of strategy, which is basically an apolitical level, um, where you know, politicians stay out no micromanaging mm. these And this is actually the, the policy of President Trump in, in Afghanistan, a, turning it over to yeah, the people. Yeah, and, and, and the day, you know, one of the dangers is it allows politicians to abandon their responsibilities because if, you, and, you, and you, know, you can see this in the UK um, with Iraq and Afghanistan is, well, you know, I took military advice and you wouldn't want me to question military advice. Uh, and I followed it. Well, no, actually you should question military advice. That's part of your, your job. Uh, you may follow it in the end, but you've certainly got to question it. And uh, and you can see this, uh, I, I, again, it's not, it's not in this particular book, but I, I, I did a couple of essays re recently on the uh, development of the idea of strategy. Well, what, how did people actually define it during the 19th century? Well, it had a very narrow military definition. Um, it was about battle. Tactics was about how you fought. Strategy was about how you got into the position to fight. And then policy was something else. Um, so we now think about strategy as the interaction of policy um, 
and, and, and military activity. But this came quite late on, and you can see this sort of stirrings in the late 19th century, early 20th century, as military theorists realize that it's much harder to make the case that they are solely in control. They should solely be in control of how forces are deployed because they depend on the politicians for the bases, the, um, the, the, the budgets. Uh, and so is it reasonable to say that we've been let down because you haven't given enough money or you haven't uh, secured this bit of foreign land in order for us to place ourselves in pre preparation for a campaign? Uh, and then say, how what, what happens thereafter has nothing to do with you. And so you, you, you can see them grappling with it. Uh, but in the end, the, the, they, they, the comfort zone is politicians should keep out. Uh, I think that's completely broken down over the last uh, couple of decades, where clearly the wars that were being fought were so political in everything that was being done that we've moved so far away from the idea of the decisive battle to a large number of smaller scale encounters which add up to something that, that, that looks a, you know, a lot different at the end. Um, the, I don't think you can argue for this strict separation, but, but the, 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 the uh, ethos is still very much there. Yeah, and uh, so, uh, one of the sections of your book looks at what fictional writers mm. were saying about war. So, so I, I sense that you're constantly asking, well, where where do the ideas come from? What are the ideas? What motivates the people with the ideas? What is their agenda beyond what they're arguing about? Yeah, I, mean, I think fictions, uh, especially uh, on some of these you know, really big questions of, of what war might look like, very important. Um, and at different times, there have been different uh, fictional approaches to this. I mean. The best example is probably H.G. Wells, um, who, who was incredibly prolific, had a political agenda. Um, he was sort of Fabian socialist and great believer in world government. He thought world government would only happen when states abandoned nationalism, and they'd only do that when some horrible, great, big, enormous war had, had uh, shown them how dangerous uh, this was. So there's a book he wrote called The World Set Free, which captures this idea, the world would be set free from war. It was published just before the First World War, um, which introduced the idea of atomic bombs. Now, he was pretty au fait with the science uh, of the time. Uh, he, 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 we know what he'd read, and, and uh, we, we know who he modeled key characters upon. Uh, he didn't particularly describe accurately what the bombers would be like or how they would be constructed, but you know this was at a time when a lot of people were saying they could never be constructed. But we do know that in um, the early 1930s, Leo Szilard, who was there, a Hungarian uh, who had emigrated to work to escape uh, anti-Semitism, was then in London. He later came to the States and was the person who was very influential in persuading Einstein to write to President Roosevelt um, about an atomic bomb program, led to the Manhattan program. Well, we know that, that, that he'd read, he'd met Wells, he'd read A World Set Free quite recently. Um, and um, when he was thinking about the problems uh, and decided how a chain reaction was possible, uh, this, was, this was the atomic bomb. Uh, so it's called the atomic bomb because of Wells. Uh, and um, you know, the, the Wells' influence in other areas, you know, the, when tanks came along during the first, first World War, they bore very little relationship to those that uh, the armoured vehicles Wells had described in a much earlier book. But those who were worrying about this question had Wells, still had Wells in mind. So I think they are influential. Um, and it's, you know, one of the, the big issues with his vision was whether uh, he was correct, not in the sense that we got world government, uh, but after the demonstration of the power of atomic bombs, um, we haven't had another nuclear war. Hopefully we never will. Um, but that's quite a long run uh, that we've been through already. And um, 
So, you know, maybe there, there was a kernel of truth in what he was saying. Uh, a, a section of your book looks at future wars, the introductions of uh, uh, cyber, of, uh, of robots, a conflict taking place in megacities. And so this raises the other important dimension uh, in addition to ideas and where they're coming from, and that is the, the love affair with technology, that technology will change everything uh, with regard to the next war. But, but it's really, history tells us, well, no, it won't. Well, it does, but not, but not to the extent that people hope, uh, and not necessarily in ways that they imagine. So, um, for a country like America, which would you know, prefer capital intensive to labor intensive wars, as it were, technology is uh, an enormous attraction and always has been uh, as, as a way of um, gaining some sort of strategic advantage, reducing dependence on, on manpower, um, or people power now because it, it, it's men and women. Um, so, that's always been uh, a part. And there's a tendency which became very strong in the 50s after a succession, of, if you just think of the tank, the aircraft, radar, um, submarines, uh, missiles, then atomic bombs, then hydrogen bombs, um, the technology would keep on throwing up new challenges and so on. Um, what happened, I think, was uh, it, it, the new technologies couldn't change the basic logic of what we came to call mutual assured destruction. So it didn't make a lot of difference uh, in that sense. It, it raised new questions and challenges, but it, it didn't really shift that. Then there were the new technologies associated with the digital age, which seemed to provide an alternative to reliance on nuclear weapons. Um, and what I think we've seen here, I think there's two points, is you, the, the, these do allow you to do things that you couldn't do before, so you can't ignore that. But the actual way they're employed and what they're employed in combination with uh, makes a difference. An example, I just had two examples. One. The great advantage of pre precision guided munitions was that it would enable you um, to avoid civilian targets. You could, you could uh, attack the center of a city and you wouldn't hit a hospital or a school because you knew where the hospital and the school was and you were sufficiently confident in your cruise missile or whatever that it would work its way around the street map and hit exactly what it was supposed to hit. Uh, and that's true, you, you, if you want to fight a war that way. But if you decide that actually really what you want to do is to hit hospitals and schools, you can do that too. It's a choice that you've now got that you didn't have before. Um, and therefore, it, it doesn't mandate a particular strategy. I think we wanted to think that these weapons mandated a strategy that, that allowed you to spare non-combatants, but it turns out not necessarily so. Another example um, is uh, the ease with, uh, with which a lot of the critical uh, enabling technologies um, are now disseminated to anybody, an individual, who wants them. So that, you know, at the time of the Gulf War in 1991, um, there were a series of um, resources that were space-based, uh, accurate imagery of, of, of the where forces were deployed, e speed of communications, um, uh, p uh, positioning, so you knew, you knew where you were, you knew where other people were, uh, <coughs> navigation. All of these are now on your iPhone. Um, the, the, so things that really made a difference to the ability of the American military <coughs> to catch the Iraqis completely by surprise and completely outfight them, are now available to me. Um, now, I, I don't link them with any firepower myself, um, but others do. So, um, 
and then, of course, you, you know, you later on you get the social media side of it, and all of a sudden, a whole series of instruments are available to whoever wants them. Now, you, again, it doesn't mandate a particular approach. It, it doesn't tell. It doesn't make war less destructive. It doesn't mean that uh, in the end people will fight with the weaponry that they can find, however crude uh, and basic it is. Uh, but it does create new choices and new possibilities. But it also leads to the wrong lessons learned when you go into Iraq a second time and don't deal with the consequences of your quick victory. Yes. I, I, I mean, I think there's obviously a number of things going on in 2003, of which one was Rumsfeld's determination to demonstrate um, that, in contrast to Colin Powell, who needed who wanted half a million troops um, to defeat Iraq in 1991. Powell could do it with a third of the number. Uh, sorry, uh, Rumsfeld could do it with a third of the number, and he could. Um, but what that meant was that they had no capacity to deal with what followed. It wasn't that Rumsfeld hadn't thought about it. He just didn't want anything to do with it. And um, had not been forced to answer the question, um, are you sure you can avoid these issues? Uh, you know, there's a perfectly good argument um, that you, you you don't want to hang around. You want to get out as soon as possible. That eventually you'd be seen as occupiers and be part of the problem. To which the answer is yes. That, that that's what will happen, uh, and you you won't be able to avoid that problem by becoming occupiers and running away because you won't be able to get away because you won't have anything to nobody to hand over power to, um, and so it proved. So, the, uh, I, mean, the, the, I mean, this is stuff that I dealt with a lot as a member of the UK Iraq inquiry, is that the issues are recognised, they're somebody else's problem, uh, and no preparations are made, or hardly any preparations are made for what may need to be done. As if you, uh, and it's not a question of, I mean, there's always going to be a degree of improvisation, but if you've got no capacity, you just don't have the numbers of troops, um, you don't have the administrators prepared, uh, you haven't thought about issues like as simple as curfews, then you know, don't be surprised when, when things go very badly wrong and a lot of people, Iraqi and American and British, lose their lives. One final question uh, requiring a, a brief answer. Uh, what would you like the different audiences to get from your book on the future of war? The public, on the one hand, the the policy makers, on the other. Well, the ending sort of message, which is a, maybe a bit lame, is is be skeptical. Um, the, that uh, when people tell you this is how it's going to be, uh, say yeah, are you sure? Uh, and uh, and ask questions. So that's the, the, the that's the basic message for policy makers. Uh, the message for academics. Um, about uh, you know, the, the limits of, of quantification, but also you know where it can be useful. It's not it's not a wholly anti-quant book. There are some have seen it as such, but it's not not really. I think for the public, you know, what, what do you want to, out of a book? You want you want people to find it interesting, to 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 want, to want to keep on turning the pages and to discover things about the past um, that they may not have known. And in the process to make them skeptical too, to 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 ensure you know if you're working in this field without pushing too hard or being too pious about it, you, you're you're hoping for a more informed, a more questioning public, uh, and if it helps a bit towards that, that's great. If it just if just find it interesting, that's great too. Well, uh, Sir Lawrence, uh, on that note, I want to thank you very much for being uh, our guest on Conversations with History. And I think I will show your book, The Future of War, A History, uh, which uh, there's a lot more in it than we were able to discuss in this hour of conversation. So thank you very much to our audience for joining us for this conversation with history.